Selamat siang semua. Ya. Terima kasih banyak bahwa Anda sedang bergabung dengan presentasi ini. Saya suka um, melanjutkan um, um, dalam bahasa Indonesia, tetapi um, bahasa Belanda adalah bahasa pertama saya. Dan bahasa Inggris saya um, juga masih lebih baik daripada bahasa Indonesia saya. Daarom heb ik besloten om deze presentatie vanmiddag in het Nederlands te gaan geven. En ik hoop dat jullie daar geen bezwaar tegen hebben. Without joking, I think English is probably the best compromise for this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I'll show you a number of photographs, completely random. Um, most of them actually through the eyes of my family, who have lived here for more than two centuries in this beautiful city. Uh, the big family, um, and at the same time, um, they probably also show a little bit of the technical progression of the city. Next. And that all started um, with this picture. Um, the guy on the top right side was my first ancestor that arrived here in Jakarta in 1776. And you probably can already see by his face, um, like many of my family members, a very, very handsome man. The excuse is that he was already 78 at the time of this photo. Anyway, you probably recognize the building um, along the Molenfleet Canal, Jalan Gajamada. This is the Arsip National, the Gudung Arsip National, and Jalan Gajamada 111. And that was actually the building because he arrived as a poor VOC soldier. He was a Polish Jew. Um, he arrived as a poor soldier and he was the bodyguard of Governor General de Klerk, who actually lived on these premises. And he was the bodyguard between 1777 and 1780. What happened on one night while on duty, he was caught asleep. It was not good at that time. So he was punished. Um, he received a very good lashing, 50 strokes with a rotten stick. So that must have been very painful. Um, anyway, he made a vow um, and actually said, one day I'm going to buy this house of my boss and I'll invite all the dignitaries of the, of the colonial world and we're going to have parties every year in this building. So everyone laughed at him, at him in 1780 That was impossible because he was a poor VOC soldier. However, the man couldn't read or write, but he had a commercial talent. And he made a fortune um, as a goldsmith, as a pawnbroker, as a moneylender. And guess what? 38 years later, in 1819, he had enough money to buy this property. And he, every year on the anniversary of his 50 Um, beatings by the rotten stick, he invited uh, high officials of, uh, of the colonial world and they uh, partied in this, in this building and it was pretty noisy. And it's all described in my book, 250 Years in, in, uh, in Old Jakarta. Of course, the man was very fortunate of that time because he lasted until 1834. He was 79 years old, which for that time was an extraordinary um, old age. Um, so he was able to um, organize 15 parties at, that, um, at, uh, at the house. Next. Um, Leendert Miro, that was his name. Uh, he actually had an original biblical name, Yehuda Leip Yechiel Eagle Eagle. Too difficult to remember. So also for people in Jakarta at the time, so he changed it to Leendert Miro. He was buried in 1834 on these premises, Pondok Gede. So he didn't wait until he could buy the property on um, Jalan Kajamada. Uh, by 1800, he already had this immense country estate, 325 hectares um, in his possession. That's why he, where he was buried. And I spoke to someone um, probably 30 years ago, and his tombstone was still present on this site in 1984. By 1985, it was all demolished, and according to the locals, his tombstone was used for the construction of a local mosque. Um, the guy at that time told me, did you know that actually that Leonard Mira was a Jew? 
Anyway, it, uh, as you can see in Pakradija's book, uh, where the, there is, I think, an, uh, an, uh, an aerial photo of Pondokkode as well. It's now a shopping center. Next photo. Um, two other ancestors of my family that actually arrived in Jakarta a little bit later, in 1816, were these two brothers on the bottom side, uh, Adrianus Big on the right side and Janus, or actually Doris Big on the left side. They were actually two brothers. Um, part of a large expedition organized by Professor Reinwart, or actually facilitated by Professor Reinwart, but organized by the first king of the Netherlands, King Willem I, in 1815. Because people in Holland had a problem. There was no photography. And how do you show the 9 million population of the Netherlands at that time how their colony far, far away looked like? So they actually constructed a expedition, and that contained of painters, novelists, uh, botanists, uh, a lot of scientists as well, and draughtsmen. So these two um, ancestors of mine were uh, draughtsmen. And they settled in, um, in Jakarta, however they traveled a lot as well. Um, Doris Big is actually linked a little bit to Raden Saleh, because in 1819, here in this beautiful city, he provided some drawing lessons to um, Raden Saleh. And the famous uh, drawing of Diponegoro when he was caught in 1830 uh, was uh, sketched by um, his brother um, Adrianus Big. And uh, the drawing was finalized here in Jakarta in, uh, in 1830. Next. Fast forward to 1884, and by that time photography was already introduced. Um, a link to the previous pages, if you see the old lady sitting on the chair on the, on the left side there, uh, with a beautiful um, batek sarong. Um, she was the sister-in-law of Leendert Miro, the one of the parties on Jalan Gajamada. At the time of this photo, she was 89, so we are looking at a photo from 1884 with someone who was born in 1795. And I, I find that extraordinary, actually that we have someone on the, on the photo from a, a previous um, century. Anyway, um, the couple on the top left side, standing very close to each other, um, were my great-great-grandparents. And they actually married in the same year, in 1884. Um, this picture was taken with only a small part of the family on what was called Gang Bin On, but this Gang no longer exists. It's actually next to what was called the, um, the King Willem III Gymnasium in um, uh, near Salemba. Uh, this was a beautiful uh, country estate. And the photo on the, on the right side is actually their daughter and my great-grandmother. Um, that was a um, photo taken at the studios of Woodbury and Page here in Jakarta. Lovely girl and she is smiling. Next photo. Um, the couple on the left that you saw in the previous photo settled in Tana Abang. Um, my great-great-grandfather was a very lucky man because he inherited close to one million guilders at the time from um, Janus Big, one of the draughtsmen. And he bought out a lot of family members of Tana Abang and actually settled on a massive estate close to Pasar Tana Abang on Tana Abang Bukit. And when he went to work, he probably saw this scene quite often as well. And when you see historic pictures of Jakarta, quite often you see the famous, what I call, washing ladies along the Molenfleet Canal, Jalan Kajamada, Jalan Hayam Buruk. Um, but this, I think, I find this equally fascinating, actually, that you have a canal running in between. On the left side, actually, is Jalan, what's now Jalan Abdul Muiz. On the right side, uh, Jalan Tana Abang Timur. In Tana Abang, a pretty wide canal at the time, and uh, people were just gathering, fishing, uh, probably talking and eating as well. Um, and this lively scene probably happened throughout the day uh, in the late um, 19th century and early 20th centuries. Um, these days, if you stand on that, uh, the bridge actually still exists between Jalan Abdel Muiz and Jalan Tana Abang Timur. If you st stand on there, uh, there's probably not much seafood in the, in the much narrower canal um, in our days. Um, and the only animals that you probably see are gray and they have a long tail. Next photo. Um, a little bit of uh, more technical progression. Um, I quite often complain myself about the noisy, pesky motorbikes that are currently in Jakarta. However, my own grandfather 
owned one in 1926, as you can see here on this picture. So he probably was contributed to a lot of noise in, uh, in pre-World War II Jakarta at that time as well. He's actually sitting on his motorbike here on Tana Abang Bukit in 1926. And on the back, maybe unusual, uh, Ibu Suntje. And Ibu Suntje um, was a very old lady in 1926. Uh, worked for decades on uh, my country's or my family's country estate on Tana Abang. And she always described um, that as a noisy monster and they, he should have never bought it. But she had one dream and that was actually to sit on the back of a motorbike and be driven around town by my grandfather. So on one day it actually happened. And my grandmother told me that it was such a fascinating scene there in Tana Abang that my grandfather left with Ibu Suntje on the back and she was singing and screaming all the way uh, through uh, Jakarta at the time. It must have been a fantastic scene and I'm not sure if anyone caught that on camera. Next. Oh, we skipped one. Yes, this one. Not a technical progression. 1933, um, again linked to uh, my family, uh, this very pretty house um, on now Jalan Mohammed Yamin, previously Jalan Madura, was be, uh, actually bought by my uh, great-grandfather. And that was the husband of that lovely girl that you saw on the Woodbury and Page um, um, photo of 1892. Um, this house, as you can see, it has no ventilation grids above the windows. This was the first air-conditioned house in Jakarta in 1933. And that was earlier than many other important buildings in the city. So, for example, um, Istana Merdeka on Madame Merdeka had a one air-conditioned room for the Governor General installed in 1940. The Nirom, which was the, um, the radio uh, broadcasting company, uh, on the same site as where Radio Republic Indonesia is uh, based at the moment on uh, Madame Merdeka Barat, um, had air-conditioned studios for the first time in 1938, the same year that actually the trains uh, running through the island of Java had air-conditioned air uh, carriages as well. Uh, but it was actually a, a novelty in, in 1933. Uh, it had to be imported from the United States of America. And as you can see on the photo on the, on the left, um, that's actually uh, my aunt, sister of my grandmother, um, who was actually in the back garden here with a humongous water tower. Uh, that actually provided the coolness in the house. But I'm afraid not only the coolness in the house, but probably also very noisy to neighbors, especially the ones very close there at the back on, uh, on Jalan uh, Indramayu. Next photo. Another technical progression. Um, on Pasar Gambir, Pasar Gambir in 1938. Pasar Gambir was an annual fair held in pre-World War II uh, Jakarta for the first time in 1906 and then it was held annually from 1921 onwards. You see on the internet a lot of cases, including the Wikipedia page, it actually says that the Pasar Gambia ran until World War II and that the last edition was in 1941 and 1942, which is not true. Uh, this was the second last one in 1938 and 1939 was the, was the last uh, Pasar Gambia. Afterwards, uh, the war broke out in Europe and later in the Pacific, and uh, they found it not appropriate to organize a, such a feast in Jakarta. Um, fantastic pictures, because this was the, these were the first pictures ever taken in Jakarta in color, so with a color um, photo camera. And the other special thing about Pasar Gambia was the, it was the only event in Jakarta, the only annual event, where actually everyone in the city could, could join. It was not like the Chikini swimming pool or the Mangarai swimming pool that was only allowed for, uh, for white people or for Japanese people. Um, now Indonesians, uh, Dutch people, Chinese, Arab people, everyone could join the Pasar Gambir and you could sit in the merry-go-round uh, next to someone from Kampung Bukit Duri, for example, and, and, and maybe the governor general's wife was in, in the carriage next to it. It was a lot of food and the structures were actually uh, pretty amazing too because all the structures that you see in the 1938 photo here, for example, were actually built specifically for the 1938 Pasar Gambir and it was a two-week event usually at the, in the last two weeks of August and afterwards they were demolished again. Next photo. Same year, 1938. Um, my grandmother used to work for the Javas Bank, what's now the Bank Indonesia, in Kota, same building now on uh, near Taman Fatahila, uh, and Station Kota. Um, 
And she had to take the bike from her house on Tana Abang Bukit to Harmony. And from Harmony, she was allowed to take the tram to Kota. And this was actually the tram, so she usually parked her bike in front of what is now the, um, uh, the bank, the Postpa bank there on the corner of Harmony. And then took tram line four um, to, uh, to Kota. And th this tram line actually ran from Tana Abang to Kota, so I've ne never been sure why actually she had to take the bike from Tana Abang to Harmony. But it's probably because her parents thought that she had to do a little bit of exercise anyway. Um, which was actually strange because on the way back, at the end of a hard working day, when she was tired, she had to take the bike and push it all the way from Harmony to Tana Abang, which was actually on a slight incline. So it must have been very sweaty when she um, arrived there. Anyway, uh, you probably recognize a little bit here. So this was actually at the start of Jalan um, Gajamada, and we see the uh, still in a much more prettier condition than it is today, Hotel de Galerie uh, on the corner of Jalan Joanda and Jalan uh, Hayam Buruk. Next. And when my grandmother arrived back at home at the end of a working day, 30 seconds before she actually parked her bike, this was the view that she had um, of Tana Abang Bukit. And it was actually like half the estate. So her house with her grandparents was actually there on the left side behind the trees. Single story house. That was a massive house that used to belong to to my family as well. But after my great great grandfather passed away in 1918, those were all sold. Um, and the director of the firm McLean and Watson actually lived in that house at that time in 1923. And there was a similar double-story house on the other side. If this would have been a panorama photo, you would actually would have seen a, a, almost like a mirrored view of, um, of, of, uh, of this picture. Now, just by raising hands in this audience, who of you think that that, that beautiful house on the right does still exist today? Please raise your hand if you think that house does still exist today. No one of you thinks that. Then the tree, that beautiful, massive tree on the, on the left side. Who of you think that the tree does still exist today? Yeah, a few hands, a few hands there. Um, anyway, absorb this into your brain, this picture. As soon as I say next, you see exactly the same scene, but then in 2020. Next. This is 2020. Still a very pretty, relaxing place to live, I think, or not? at least still place to park your bike. Yeah. Now, the tree, the tree has gone already um, at the end of the 1950s, uh, because the Angatan Udara Republic Indonesia had their Markas Bazaar on Tana Abang Bukit, so that there were a few more offices, Scott, but the, actually the house that you saw on the picture uh, survived until the mid-1980s, which I think is extraordinary for a building that was previously a mansion of uh, uh, Governor General van Imhof and built in 1740. So that has basically survived for 245 years. A little bit of additions and the, the columns at the front had to be strengthened, but actually I've seen pictures in 1983 and the, the, the building still looked uh, pretty okay. Next. We are going to uh, jump from Tana Abang to Menteng. Why? Because Menteng is my next project. And that might end up in a book. And why Menteng? Because when I was preparing for my first book, I quite often stayed in Menteng. And I discovered each and every time when I came back to Jakarta, one of the beautiful houses that I took photos of six months ago was all gone. It was like corrugated iron. And I thought, how is that possible? Because there is a protected cultural heritage law which was implemented in 1993 and that should protect uh, houses in Menteng. Um, but apparently that law has, was circumvented, partly because it was probably Im implemented at a time when already 40, 50 percent of all Manteng houses had already disappeared. So how can you actually reinforce um, such a law? Um, but in the last 10 years, it's actually going at a dangerous and, and, and rapid pace. And if we don't do anything about Manteng, um then maybe it will have the same fate as Tana Abang, where I've done a calculation and there are actually 2% of all historic buildings in Tana Abang are left. In Manteng, we are currently already sitting at 80% demolished across the board. So best examples, for example, Taman Surapati, where most of the houses are still there, but lots of other streets, uh, more than 80% of the houses, original houses have already been demolished. And that's not because those are houses that are so, so important that they have to be kept, but there are so many examples of 
houses in Menteng, because Menteng was designed as a garden city. It was actually an, 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 a very unique urban planning concept 100 years ago, but it was also a playground of a lot of architects, European architects, but also Indonesian architects, and they implemented everything from Jugend style to Art Deco and what they call um, uh, new business style. It, it was all there and I spoke to architects in Jakarta in the past weeks and they've all said that so many original buildings in Menteng have already been demolished that we have to send our students to Europe, for example, to show how a Jugend steel house was designed. Well, actually we had all those examples in Menteng. Anyway, um, on the previous picture you saw what I call always the gateway to Menteng and that is to me is a very precious part. Uh, can we uh, quickly go back to the previous page, please? Yeah, because you see the Kunstkring building on the left, you probably recognize that. Um, we see Jalan Toku Umar um, going straight through where the cars are actually entering and, uh, and, and exiting and if the photographer would turn around 180 degrees he would see the Masjid Chut Mutia on that side and the, and, and, and the train tracks um, as well. Uh, of course, Kunstkring exists. How many of you raise hands again think that that lovely house on the right still exists today too? No? You all think it's been demolished? No. A few of you think that it does still exist. It does still exist. It does still exist, but it has been empty for the past 12 years already and it starts crumbling. I mean, it's pretty solid because most of the walls are made of reinforced concrete. The tower on top is actually made of, uh, of, of solid rock and um, that's why it's still there. I think if this would ever be demolished, it would almost mean an amputation of Manteng, of one lack of Manteng. I think I can live with the fact that maybe 80 or 90 percent of Manteng will ever be demolished and, and, and not be kept, but let's keep this gateway of Manteng. And I have a dream actually that this house should actually be renovated and it should actually represent the gateway of Manteng. So young architects, people interested in urban planning, uh, people interested in Jakarta's history in, in, in general should actually be able to come to a place in Manteng where they can actually learn about urban planning and how Jakarta developed and how that garden city was actually developed. Learn about their inhabitants. How did Father Heuken live for, um, for nearly 50 years in, in, in Menteng? What were his experiences and his photos, etc. And so many other examples from, uh, from Mohammed Hatta on Jalan Diponokoro 57 to um, General Nasution on Jalan Toko Uma 40. There are so many um, important and well-known Indonesia, there's so much history in Manteng that should actually be preserved. But people should also be, uh, come there and actually have almost like a Google Street experience and see how Manteng actually looks like in, in, um, in, looked like in 1940, for example. And then, for example, um, tours will be facilitated to those leftover examples in Manteng, and it could be like 25 or 35 houses where people can actually experience how Manteng was developed between 1911 and 1947. That's my presentation so far. Um, if you go to the next page, uh, I publish a lot on Jakarta's history um, when I'm not in this country and back at home in Australia, where, by the way, I almost forgot to say, I grow kangkung in my own garden back in Sydney, so and I enjoy that as well, so <laughs> referring back to the earlier kangkung uh, first. Uh, but I post regularly on social media, at, at Lost Jakarta on Instagram and Facebook, there are videos showing Jakarta in 1941-64, uh, President Sukarno uh, interview in, in, in Dutch in 1963, all on the YouTube um, uh, channel of, uh, of Los Jakarta. And of course, there's the, the website as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.